Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you can you hear me well? Sorry, I speak in, in English uh, just because the the presentation was uh, in English. Uh, uh, perhaps later on we can, if there are questions, we can we can switch into into a different language. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your your kind presentation and thank you very much for the invitation to address this this very qualified group. Um, I will try to share my presentation and hopefully you can hear me well. Uh, so let me see if. Can you see the presentation? Okay. So what I'm planning Perfect. to do today, thank you. So what I'm planning to do today is is fairly simple. Uh, it's uh, uh, I know that you have been already addressing issues of uh, the nexus between trade and environment, and you have uh, uh, discussed a number of issues in uh, the previous part of this of this course. What I intend to do is to uh, is to provide first an overview, which is I think the most important part of the course, because after all, the, the, the main problem that one has uh, when analyzing the trade and, and environment nexus is one of uh, encompassing the big picture rather than just getting lost in, in, in small debates and small issues. Uh, the big picture is always very useful. So I, I will try to provide uh, some form of big picture at the beginning. Then I will dive into some dossiers some sort of files or some some current events and current issues uh, because I think that for this group uh, that type of framing would be more useful and then I will move from them to some fundamental questions so from the perspective of of what I'm planning to do is is really as you see here is I will have uh, I will try to analyze this trade and environment policy link and instead of you know doing it, academically as I would tend to do it in a different setting where, where you're focusing more on, on the fundamental academic questions, I will start by situating a, a number of uh, policy debates and more specifically of dossiers of, of really work areas and work packages for those who are involved in trade negotiations, in environmental negotiations, in, 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 different, uh, in different capacities, uh, whether it is as a government official, as a negotiator, a diplomat, as someone working on a think tank, et cetera, et cetera. So as you see here, uh, just to, to walk you through the, uh, the basics of this, of this framing. So the focus on current policy debates or dossiers uh, will we'll start with um, what I see as, as the, the current state of the debates in the context of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And we'll see there a range of things but most uh, notably the, uh, the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions that have been uh, launched in the last few years and that are uh, structuring in some working areas that I will come uh, back to uh, uh, later. Then uh, from a different perspective, if you look at the, the nexus from a different policy perspective, uh, that's what you would do uh, if you're working on environmental negotiations and environmental policy. And you would have, you know, of course, the uh, climate COP or the biodiversity COPs or the current negotiations on plastic pollution. I will not take the usual uh, sort of uh, and unpack the usual subjects because it, it will really be a, a selection of what is really uh, relevant right now, I think, in my view. Then we will, we will address uh, some very specific issues of uh, free trade agreements. And then uh, I will just touch very briefly on uh, on some domestic policies or, or or unilateral policies that are particularly important for Latin American countries. Uh, and of course, one could unpack different aspects here, just as the IRA in the United States, uh, the current green subsidy policy in China. Uh, but the main sort of the elephant in the room, as we will see in a moment, is a, a carbon border adjustment measure that has been adopted by the European Union. I know that you have a full lecture by my colleague, uh, Jos, Jos Paulin, uh, uh, later in one week from now, I think. Uh, but, uh, but I will mention some things that are not uh, that obvious, essentially not in the trade debate, but more in the investment debate. And then from there, we will move to uh, the more fundamental questions that are underpinning all these debates. So in, in many ways, uh, this and many other debates are just avatars of uh, 
a very small number of fundamental and still unresolved questions. And, and I will try to start with the, uh, you know, the policy dossiers, which is uh, what, what you're working on more, more, more likely, and then uh, connect them to uh, the more fundamental debate. So in short, I will do something along those lines. I will start with this thing here, and then I will move to the more fundamental debates, the underpinning questions uh, that uh, that uh, I think are the the real issues that we have to tackle. So this is the uh, the direction of travel, and let me start then with the, these dossiers, some dossiers or some uh, uh, policy debates. And of course, uh, there is a lot on the table if I if I unpack all these. So I think it's useful to focus on uh, a few of them, a few of them. And, and then if there are any questions uh, later, uh, when we get to the questions uh, part, we can unpack any other issues I and mean, either issues that are here or if I if I'm familiar with any other issues, I, I, I may be able to, to answer questions on, on something else. So let me now then start with the WTO context, and more specifically with this uh, this current iteration of the trade and environment debate uh, at the level of the WTO. So as as most people here will know, uh, you know the trade and environment debate in the WTO context has been there for a while. Actually, already in the in the agreement that created the World Trade Organization in 1994. Uh, you had a, a specific reference to sustainable development in the preamble. So we know that. We know that there was a, a committee on trade and environment that was set up to uh, debate all these issues. And that, that committee has been less active than, than what one could wish, uh, perhaps in the last years. Uh, we also know that the Doha Ministerial Declaration of 2001 had a very uh, uh, ambitious environmental package uh, that was that actually was not really fulfilled, and uh, more recently, uh, starting in November 2020, there has been an initiative to revitalize uh, the trade and environment discussions at the level of the WTO through what has been called the TSD or the Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structure discussions. Now, this is a process. This is a, a sort of process that has been organized by a number of states. It is state-led. So these are a subgroup within the WTO membership. And this subgroup is trying to advance discussions and negotiations on different issues connecting uh, trade and, and the environment. It started with a group of uh, 50 WTO members. And today it has uh, roughly 74 members. Uh, that amount to, uh, uh, you know, the majority of world trade by uh, volume. But uh, the the policy documents, the key policy documents, and again, I, I, I have put in the slides much more information than I would usually put. Uh, usually, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing here would be death by PowerPoint because there is far too much written wording in the in the slides. But I, I thought that these slides could be read, could be used as a, a sort of, a, 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 you know, an, an instrument for you to read later. Uh, so you don't need to take too many notes and you can take notes even on the, on a printed version of the slides. Uh, and that's why I, I, I decided to put the reference to some key documents, such as this ministerial uh, statement that was adopted in uh, December 2021 where this group, this the, the group behind the TSD, uh, uh, identified some areas of priority. Huh? And these areas of priority are sort of the current issues in the trade and environment nexus at the level of the WTO. What are those areas of priority? Well, uh, the areas of priority that were then uh, uh, developed through uh, informal working groups that started to work in May in May of last year. And you have four uh, areas of work. One on trade related climate measures. Uh, in other words, is that there is a lot of you know, the CBAM, the European CBAM and all its avatars. Then you have uh, an iteration of the negotiations that had already been planned in the Doha round 
but now they are moving forward in, in, in different tracks on environmental goods and services. Then uh, the efforts to try to bring into trade discussions the idea of a circular economy or circularity, and, and which is non-obvious because uh, uh, we're not yet at the level where we know exactly what to do. And then, of course, the issue of subsidies, where we know exactly what to do, but we can't do it because of political reasons. Uh, so those are the four areas, and I, I will discuss each of them. Uh, but just to give you a, a heads up of what is happening, uh, what is what are the latest developments uh, so far. So then you had in June 2022, the ministerial conference. Uh, this is a sort of a, the big event at the WTO level. Uh, the next uh, ministerial conference, MC13, will take place in February of 2024, next year, in, in the Emirates. But at this ministerial conference in, in, in June 2022, the two co-convenors of, of the TSD, uh, Canada and Costa Rica, uh, brought a, a report on progress that is a useful document uh, because it tells you more or less what is being discussed uh, and what are the concerns that are being raised by different states. And I will say a word about that uh, in a moment. And then, of course, uh, the, the, key, the key thing right now, I mean, the current state of the debate is, is a preparation, uh, the preparation for the Ministerial Conference uh, uh, 13, MC 13, that will take place ne next year and, and what can be achieved there. And there are a number of things that could be achieved, whether under the umbrella of the test D or under other umbre umbrellas that I will mention in a moment. So this is sort of the, uh, the broad view of the process. And uh, if you zoom in, if you zoom in and we look at the area, so if, if, you, if, we, if you look at this aspect here, trade related measures, environmental goods and services, circular economy and subsidies, we can discuss uh, one by one, what is the current state of play? I mean, my, my, my focus on dossiers is really to tell you what, what is being discussed right now in Geneva and elsewhere. And then we will zoom out and focus on the fundamentals. But I thought it would be better to, to actually have this policy discussion just to, to bring everyone uh, on, the same, uh, uh, on the same level, even I mean, whether you are a trade negotiator or working on something else. Now, what is the elephant in the room uh, in connection with this first area of work, trade-related climate measures? But of course, the EU CIMA. Uh, that's a major, major concern. Uh, it's the first major measure. Uh, there have been many attempts at, at developing uh, uh, carbon border adjustment measures or carbon equalization measures. Uh, and the first that actually has seen the day, and, and it's a very important because the EU is a major importer uh, of, uh, of, of goods from around the world, well, is this EU season. And, and again, I know that you will be looking at it in a full session with a colleague, but uh, I, I need to mention it because it's uh, it's just the, uh, the elephant in the room in this in this track of negotiations. But it's not the only thing, of course. Huh? And many things that are related to this CBAM or uh, the different forms of uh, what the carbon equalization measure can, can take, well, uh, a lot of that is being discussed from the perspective of uh, the mapping of a potential best practices in related to trade-related climate measures. So the point here is to what extent uh, the adoption of unilateral measures to, to take climate action will interfere with trade. Yeah? And the point, of course, of this effort is to say, well, are there any best practices? And behind the scenes, of course, are, are many discussions of what are those best practices. I, I will say a word in a moment, but I just want to set the, the, the ground for this. Then there is a major issue of standardization in relation to carbon measurement and methods. Uh, for example, I, I worked in a couple of years ago, I worked for a major corporation I mean, uh, as, as a consultant, uh, and they were very interested in, in entering and positioning themselves in the carbon, uh, in the carbon measurement market. Because if you have carbon equalization measures that are going to be applied across the board, you will need to standardize that. And that will be a huge market. I mean, the, the market of how to measure the carbon content or the carbon intensiveness of a product uh, and how that you know has implications for duties at the border. And then of course one broader measure that 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 is raised by this connection between climate change and the WTO 
is uh, to what extent uh, measures that are adopted to comply with environmental obligations are consistent or compatible with trade obligations. Uh, so just looking at these four elements, the uh, four points that are being discussed that are in red. So for the elephant in the room, as I mentioned, this will be discussed elsewhere. But one aspect that I think it's very important not to lose sight of, and that was completely omitted in the initial uh, assessment conducted by the European Commission when, uh, when designing the first draft uh, and publishing the first draft of this, this regulation in, I think it was in, in mid-2021, uh, is, of course, the investment side. And how is the investment regulation side uh, uh, concerned here? Uh, most people are not looking at it, but it's important. Uh, uh, of course, it depends on whether your country has signed and ratified uh, investment treaties. Many Latin American countries have, uh, but not, of, not all of them. And the question is, it, it appears it, it, it is raised in the following terms, and you can ask more questions later if you're interested. So right now, trade happens a lot through global production chains. So that means that the, a, a single product is produced, even if it's produced in a state, say Brazil, uh, it is produced with input that is being imported from around the world. So those inputs that may have different forms. I mean, they may take the form of just uh, primary raw materials, or they may take the form of, of parts, subparts, or they may take the form of cement or, or aluminum or steel or something else. So all those inputs, if there is a trade measure that seeks carbon equalization, they would hit, they would affect the cost of the input. Okay. What you're importing, sadly, is more expensive. As simple as that. If what you're importing to produce your good is suddenly more expensive, then an investor in a state that is trying to produce a good, well, is now required to produce at a much higher cost. If that happens, then it's not only a matter of trade law, it's a matter of investment. Law. And the way in which investment law operates is very different from the way in which trade law operates. In trade law, there may be uh, potentially a request for consultations. Then there may be uh, a case before the WTO dispute settlement organs and so on. And that will take time. If you lose as a country, then you have to withdraw your mission. But in the meantime, you have provided, you know, you have, you have provided perhaps an advantage to your uh, uh, domestic industry or you have at least interfered with this global production chain. In investment is different simply because every single investor that is affected can sue separately. And if you lose, you have to pay uh, for all the damage that has been caused. So you have a retrospective uh, side, which is not present in trade. So you see that this investment side of, uh, of the EU CVM um, of other carbon border adjustment measures is not at all being discussed. And that's a major, major elephant in the room. Uh, on the rest of it, just to tell you what is being done uh, today, so mapping of potential best practices in relation to trade-related climate measures. So one uh, best practice that has been discussed a lot is uh, equivalence, equivalence in carbon pricing mechanisms. So imagine that you're a country that is exporting to the European Union. And uh, your, the goods that you export, uh, or just to, to make it broader and, and not to be too focused on the European Union, imagine that you're a country that is exporting to another country that is introducing a, climate, a trade related climate measure. So essentially, a duty at the border or some form of uh, 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 duty at the border that makes your uh, product more costly when it, 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 it lands in the uh, in the market, in the final market. Now, the reason why your product is being more expensive uh, is that at least uh, on the policy goal, the importing country is trying to equalize, equalize the cost of carbon in, in its internal market with respect to the market where the product is being produced. 
So if it's cheaper to produce in China, because there are no climate regulations, and then it's cheaper to produce cement, and you send the cement to the European Union, or you send the steel to the European Union, then the European Union would want to protect its industry to put them on the same uh, level playing field, because its steel industry in the European Union is subject to, uh, to a, a sort of carbon pricing uh, measure. Now, if you're an exporter, if you're an exporting country, you will be concerned about you know, higher costs, more duties, more uh, procedures in your major market, in the market to which you're exporting. And one way to avoid that problem is to have in your own country where you produce uh, a carbon pricing mechanism that is deemed equivalent to the carbon pricing mechanism in the market where you export to, okay? Because if the two carbon pricing mechanisms, the one in the exporting country and the one in the importing country are deemed equivalent, then the regulation that makes your product more costly may not apply. And that's the logic of equivalence. When there is equivalence in the carbon pricing systems, uh, then uh, you may be exempt from uh, a trade-related kind of measure, you see? Now, how can you argue that your measures are equivalent, that your carbon pricing measures are equivalent? Well, you need some sort of benchmark, some sort of standard. And this is one of the issues uh, that, that may pop up from discussions on best practices. Another issue is standardization on the technical aspects, I mean, the, the basic things. And this, of course, affects a lot uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. Because uh, calculating what is your carbon footprint and, and doing that in, in a certain format that has to be reported to uh, an importer and in order to be sold in the, the markets where you sell or where, where you export to, uh, well, that has a cost. Huh? The company that I was uh, mentioning earlier would be selling its own services on how to measure your carbon footprint, and that services would have a cost. And and it's it's a uh, it's what they call in, in in English red tape. I mean, it's it's complication. Exporting is more complicated, and in order to to reduce the complication, you require you you need services service providers that will do the work for you, and that will make uh, your exports more costly. And that's an, a particular issue for uh, small companies, small businesses. For the big businesses, it's, it's less of an issue. It is an issue, but they have more capacity to uh, to deal with it. And then you have uh, you know the broader issue of 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 consistency between uh, environmental agreements and trade agreements. There are many issues that can be uh, touched upon here. And I mentioned the issue of climate clubs. I mean, there has been discussion of a climate waiver. A climate waiver means that because you're taking measures uh, for climate change, trade uh, trade disciplines should not apply in the same way. So you're in some way exempt from trade disciplines. And there is the, the, the old debate about uh, trade-related environmental measures and their consistency under the gut. And, and let me just mention something that may pop up. You may have heard the, the issue of climate clubs. Uh, these uh, these climate clubs have been proposed as a concept by uh, a very famous economist in the United States, William Norhaus. And the point of a climate club is that you have like a number of countries uh, that are, are uh, major importers that can uh, that have a lot of market power. And that group of countries would only allow imports from outside, from outside the club if those imports uh, have some form of you know, compliance with you know, climate obligations. So a climate club would be, would be a, an area, a number of countries that consider them to be equivalent in terms of climate, or, uh, climate requirements, typically carbon pricing. And because they, they feel that they are equivalent, they trade among themselves. Anyone who is outside the club cannot sell the products inside the climate club unless it's pay, it pays a duty. 
So that is expected to be some form of incentive to join the club. And how do you join the club? Well, by introducing some form of current pricing. It's very similar to equivalence. Uh, it's a, an issue of equivalence. Equivalence plus is, is like saying, well, I have introduced a very sophisticated carbon pricing system in my economy. And as a result, I should now be allowed into the club and trade freely inside the club. Now, is this, uh, any, is this going to happen? Well, the CBAM is in, in a way, the beginning of a climate club. Uh, the G7 uh, during the German presidency made a specific statement on developing a climate club quite recently, uh, quite recently in, in June 2022. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, the idea is, is politically difficult to, to achieve. Uh, and it would have also to overcome a number of legal hurdles that we can discuss later. But I, I just want to mention it as part of the uh, you know, trade-related climate measures. Second major area uh, of uh, discussion in the TSD, environmental goods and services. Now, what's the point of environmental goods and services? I mean, what's the elephant in the room? Well, the elephant in the room is that when a good or a service is good for the environment, it should be traded more freely. So there would be some form of promotion of these goods and services by uh, facilitating their trade. And how do you facilitate their trade? Well, there are many different ways, but the most basic way is to address tariffs, to reduce the tariffs, to reduce the tariffs that you apply to that category of goods or that category of services. So there are many things that are being discussed. So, you know, the main thing is what are environmental goods and services. Of course, every country will try to say, my goods and my services are environmental, so it can sell them better, more easily. Uh, but you know there is some practice out there, I'm going to say a word in a moment, and then there is some uh, discussion within the, uh, within the uh, uh, testee. And what is happening is essentially this. Uh, the main examples that are being reviewed right now uh, are the experience of the uh, uh, APEC of the uh, of this organization, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC? Uh, this organization uh, started by liberalizing uh, environmental goods initially by capping the tariffs applied to a range to a, a range of environmental goods at no more than five percent. And now it has moved into the environmental services arena. Uh, trading services and trading goods are quite different, as you know. You know in, in trading goods, you have, you know, it's you have a full sort of set of schedules with tariffs. Where in trading services, uh, you have to you have to place yourself. I mean, each country will uh, decide uh, on what services uh, it will accept commitments in terms of tariffs tariff bounds. Uh, and that applies not only at the global level, but also at the regional level. And uh, because the elephant in the room here is how to identify what goods and what services are environmental, you need examples. And the APEC example is a good one, because uh, you have many environmental goods and services that are being addressed. And the other very good example is the Singapore-Australia Green Economy Agreement of 2022, uh, that actually has plenty of environmental goods and plenty of environmental services that are listed. Of course, it's a bilateral agreement, so it's much more difficult to negotiate this in a multilateral setting. But these are the, the main reference examples that are being discussed in WTO disc uh, uh, negotiations in this test D. Now, of course, uh, the test D is very conscious that uh, you will not reach, uh, uh, you know, you will not make that much of progress, given what happened with the Doha round, which never really moved forward on this issue. Uh, it's very difficult to make progress if you have all the goods and all the services uh, on, the, uh, on the table. So what they have trying to do is to focus and to say, well, what do we mean by an environmental good or service? Well, we mean, first of all, a good or a service that is good for climate mitigation adaptation. Okay, And then, uh, are we going to look at 
climate mitigation adaptation in any good or any service. No, let's start with goods and services that relate to renewable energy as a first sector. So they're starting small uh, to gain confidence. And because of course, renewable energy is such an important sector for the green economy and for the low carbon transition. And then what I was saying earlier, uh, I mean, in the debates over uh, environmental goods and services, the main instrument to promote uh, trade liberalization has been a reduction or the elimination of the tariff that applies to a certain category of goods. But in practice, in practice, uh, non-tariff barriers, I mean, all the barriers that, I mean, there are all sorts of non-tariff barriers, I mean, from procedures to regulations to, I mean, all sorts of tariff, non-tariff barriers to quotas, embargoes, I mean, all sorts of things. Those measures that are different from tariffs, they are actually probably a bigger obstacle to trade in environmental goods and services than tariffs themselves. So what about that? And that's, you know, countries negotiating this are very aware of this. And for example, the Singapore-Australia Green Economy Agreement addresses not just uh, tariff barriers, but also non-tariff barriers. But that's something that has to be uh, taken into account in this dossier. Third area in the test D, uh, I will be brief on, on this one because it's still exploratory. It's the circular economy and circularity. And the problem here is that there is still a lot of work to be done on how trade connects to circularity. And we may have some uh, rough ideas of how it does so, but uh, you need to do, you know, we need more than speculation. And what is being done at the level of the WTO is, you know, because it's quite open, I mean, how to address this issue, whether to look at the life cycle, whether to look at global supply chains, whether to look at waste, whether to look at, you know, uh, the recycling of critical raw materials for, for geopolitical purposes as well, because it's still quite open. What the WTO secretariat is doing is, is trying to conduct a mapping exercise uh, of, you know, what are the uh, circular economy policies that have been adopted by WTO members. And so far they have you know, they are, this is work in progress, but they have already identified quite a few, as you see, uh, over, I mean, almost, uh, you know, a bit more than 600. Uh, then again, to make uh, the discussion a bit more manageable, what they're trying to do is to, uh, to focus, to focus the discussion on a sector. And here they have selected two sectors. Of course, the first is renewable energy because of its importance. And the other is e-waste because in these discussions about the circular economy, waste, waste flows are an elephant in the room, and particularly e-waste. And what they are trying to achieve, but that it's still unclear how to achieve it, is, is essentially to extend the life of the product, to make sure that instead of being becoming e-waste, they can be repaired, they can be reused, they can be re-exported, or instead of just becoming e-waste, they can be recycled. And you know, if you think that there are many critical raw materials, including rare earths, in uh, e-waste, and that there is a, a very strong dominance in the exports of critical raw materials, particularly rare earths by China, then you know all this debate about the circular economy is not just environmental but also geopolitical. Then the last area uh, uh, that is being discussed is a monster, of course is the, the, the area of subsidies. And uh, the elephant in the room is the fact that there are massive amounts of uh, money that are being uh, channeled to very environmentally harmful activities, uh, such as you know, fossil fuel, unsustainable agriculture, and unsustainable fisheries. And uh, in the WTO, there are different trucks that are dealing with subsidies. Within the TSD and outside of the TSD, and we saw that uh, one of the areas where the test is trying to, to focus is subsidies, uh, but there is much more than that. And I will, you know, I will give you a number of examples, but uh, what is being done right now, I mean, I think that what really, I mean, what, what is the main issue uh, behind all this? Well, the main issue is that the bad subsidies, the subsidies that are environmentally disruptive, 
they are difficult to challenge uh, under WTO rules. And the good subsidies, I mean, the subsidies to renewable energies, they're easy to challenge. <laughs> and they have been challenged and they have been successfully challenged. So you have a, a sort of uh, an asymmetry where, you know, the most, dis the most harmful subsidies uh, and by, lar by far the main chunk of money that is flowing in the form of subsidies, which is subsidies to fossil fuels and, and other forms of unsustainable activities. Well, those subsidies are not being challenged, whereas subsidies to renewable energy are being challenged. And here what we see is that there is a mismatch between green industrial policy and WTO. And I will say a word about it uh, in a moment. But uh, the, the two main examples that I wanted to give you are, of course, the fossil fuel subsidies. What is being done at the level of the WTO on fossil fuel subsidies? Well, the reality is that there are many discussions, but nothing concrete. No? So that's uh, the main, the main, uh, the summary line. And, and just to give you a specific example, so the uh, the members that are negotiating uh, this discussion on fossil fuel subsidies and the reform of fossil fuel subsidies, they have been very careful with the language they use. And they have spoken about inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Okay. Now you may ask, uh, what is an inefficient fossil fuel subsidy as compared to an efficient fossil fuel subsidy? And to what extent, once you understand what is inefficient and what is efficient, these discussions are in fact not really moving forward that much. And I'm giving you here an example, uh, another case in which I worked, which is subsidies in Canada to uh, liquefied natural gas. And Canada published uh, very recently uh, in, 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 in July, 2023, and, and Canada is part of this, of this uh, Friends of Fossil Fuel Reform and, 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 and of the different uh, declarations that have been issued uh, uh, for uh, you know, fossil fuel reform. Um, Canada has stated what it considers to be efficient fossil fuels. And what you see in the definition of what Canada considers to be efficient fossil fuels is that plenty of fossil fuel subsidies would be efficient. So it's, Canada is being very generous in what is an efficient fossil fuel. So if this is a constraint that we're trying to impose and this is how we're trying to guide fossil fuel reform. Well, we're not going anywhere. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as an academic in that context. So I, I know that you're government officials and you don't have that, 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 that amount of leeway. But the reality is that we're not going anywhere on fossil fuel reform because uh, what appears to be a technicality, what is efficient and what is inefficient, well, that actually uh, where the devil is hiding. Now, I'm not go going to give you to, to leave you with bad news, so let me give you some good news. And this is something that has been 20 years in the making. Um, it's a major, it's a major step. Uh, it has been touted and presented by the WTO as the main, the first time that the WTO itself uh, negotiates an environmental agreement. This is the WTO agreement on fishery subsidies. Now, it's it's a. There are many different views on this this agreement. Uh, depending on where you sit. But overall, I think it is indeed an, achieve, uh, an achievement. And what is this agreement doing in essence? Well, it is prohibiting some subsidies. Some subsidies, what are those subsidies? Well, there are three types of subsidies that are being prohibited. Uh, the, the first category is the illegal and unre unreported and unregulated subsidies. Uh, the second category is, is, is subsidies on uh, overfished stocks. And the third category is uh, uh, subsidies uh, to fishing on uh, uh, the unregulated high seas. So the high seas fish, fish stocks that are not subject to a, a regional fisheries management organization. Now, of course, there are many loopholes in this camembert. Uh, it's a, or a gruyere, uh, it depends on, on your taste on cheese. There are many different loopholes here, but it is an achievement. It is an achievement. Uh, it is not yet in force. It is not yet in force. Uh, it requires uh, ratification by two thirds of the WTO members in order to become in force. 
it is a major sort of push and a major area of negotiation and, and, and lobbying uh, in the run-up to uh, MC13 in February 2024, because, I mean, the, the, the hope of the director generals of the WTO is that by then we will have ratified, we will have this, this treaty in operation, uh, but we're not yet there. I mean, right now there is uh, one third of the third that is required. So, uh, you know, just a few members that have ratified this fisheries agreement. But who knows? I mean, we, we may get there. Uh, just going faster uh, now, because I mentioned that there would be a number of dossiers, I'm moving from uh, the uh, test D, I mean, the, the structure discussions at the level of the WTO, and I'm leaving the WTO context and I'm moving into the context of environmental negotiations. And instead of just uh, telling you about the climate change negotiations, which again, I mean, with COP28, they are making, let's put it in these terms, slow progress. And I will stay there. If you have questions, I'm happy to uh, to address them. I mean, there is one major issue uh, on the climate justice uh, front, which is the setting up of financial arrangements on loss and damage. But the rest of it is really is really moving very slowly. Uh, so I thought I would mention something where there has been progress made, and this is the global biodiversity framework that was adopted last year. So last year, in in December of last year you have uh, an instrument that is, is the equivalent in different legal form, is the equivalent to the Paris Agreement on climate change, but for biodiversity. What you see in this slide, don't worry too much about it, is just that we really need it. <laughs> so, I mean, I could have placed far less information in this slide, but I'm, I'm giving you this slide also to be read later. But what this slide is telling you is that we really needed that global biodiversity framework because biodiversity loss is massive and we're not doing any progress on it. And we got that global biodiversity framework. And in very, very basic terms, uh, you know, that global biodiversity framework, uh, it, 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 it responded to a, a scientific need that, uh, that was expressed in the IBES report and in the Global Biodiversity Outlook, et cetera. Uh, it will guide uh, the efforts under the global, the Convention of Biological Diversity for this decade, and also with a view to 2050. So everything is being organized uh, with a view to 2030, at least, because the Sustainable Development Goals uh, have as their horizon 2030 as well. It's not a treaty. It's not a treaty like the Paris Agreement. It's just a non-binding decision of the conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it has a number of components. So in short, I mean, if you just read the document, uh, the components will appear as you see here. A number of headings with four goals and 23 targets, and then some other decisions that are complementary to the uh, global biodiversity framework. But let me zoom in a little bit and tell you what, what it looks like. But it looks like you have a certain goals. Uh, so the, there are three components, if you wish. The first component is the vision, mission, goals, and targets. And the most famous target in the global biodiversity framework is that by 2030, at least 30% of the areas covered by the framework should be under some form of protection. That is called the 30 times 30, or the 30-30 uh, uh, goal. As, as you may imagine, the uh, di di biodiversity negotiations were very much in, in the search for something similar to the temperature target of the Paris Agreement. And the 30 uh, by 30 uh, goal, uh, or actually is a target technically, uh, is what they came, back, came up with. Now, there is more on the global biodiversity framework. There are areas, I mean, there are the, the four main goals that I mentioned earlier. They, they concern conservation of biodiversity, the sustainable use of, of nature, access and benefit sharing, and then implementation. And there are many implementation techniques. And this is where trade comes in. Uh, so these are the goals, et cetera, but don't worry. I, this is what I just mentioned. And trade comes in very directly 
with respect to a number of targets. Yeah? And this is taken from a report from UNEP and, 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 and uh, a sort of a think tank. And these are just some of the targets of the global biodiversity framework where trade is directly concerned, such as wildlife trade. Uh, it's very important, invasive alien species that typically come from uh, are introduced through borders. Access and benefit sharing, as I was saying earlier, and this, this issue of access to genetic resources and how are the benefits of the use of those genetic resources shared in an equitable manner, then, etc. cetera, I mean, policy integration, business and biodiversity. And last but absolutely not least, as we have seen, subsidy reform. Huh? So the big, big issue of subsidies in trade negotiations. So you see that even when you look at the trade environment nexus, from the perspective not of trade policy, but of environmental policy, you still have the nexus very present there in the very latest developments. And uh, just very quickly on the third dossier, so we're moving to the free trade agreements contest, context. So again, this is uh, a slide for you to read later, more than, than to, to read here, but what uh, I'm trying to capture with this, this slide and, and probably much more this, this one here, is that there are, in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, perhaps a bit more, perhaps a bit more, depending on how you define this, uh, but let's say in the last 10 years or 15 years, uh, climate clauses, clauses that specifically refer to climate change have become more frequent in free trade agreements. Yeah? Uh, now these clauses, they are still, you know, they don't have that much teeth. I mean, they're not biting. Typically, they they these clauses they refer to, we need more cooperation on climate change, or they may refer, you know, they may sort of safeguard or recognize or acknowledge that uh, states have to achieve their climate commitments or their climate goals or the nationally determined contributions. Uh, or they may, uh, and probably those are the most impactful ones, they may look at renewable energy. I mean, typically, you may have carve-outs for public procurement that specifically refer to renewable energy equipment, for example. Or you may have that type of process. But what I'm just trying to convey here is that in, in trade agreements that are negotiated more recently, uh, you have a variety, a wide variety of environmental causes, including... Uh, issues such as climate change, biodiversity, and forestry. So this is becoming far more present in practice. Now, leaving very quickly the dossier part and moving now into the really the fundamental issues uh, that uh, that that are to be addressed, that are underpin all these negotiations. I mean, the real thing. This is a real thing, and these are the issues that are popping up everywhere in all the negotiations with different masks, with different faces. These are the, 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 the Indian gods that are, you know, popping up as avatars in very different negotiations everywhere. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a few words about each of them, and that will be the end of my presentation. So keep just a little energy for point three, because it's quite complicated. But point one is, is simple differentiation is is well treaded because you already have uh, had a lecture on addressing issues of differentiation. But this one here, sustainability transition, whether to make it market driven or policy driven, this is complex. Uh, this is a bit complex and it will require a little patience from you. But don't worry, this is where I'm ending. And then we can open up uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for the next uh, step of the, uh, of the lecture and then for questions. On trade liberalization, uh, whether it is a goal or an instrument. As you know, uh, in the 17, out of the 17 sustainable development goals, uh, sorry, there is a mistake here. It should be SDG 17. Uh, probably when I was drafting the uh, uh, the PowerPoint, I was, uh, my, my brain was fried uh, because I have no babysitter these days uh, because I'm on holidays. And my baby daughter is, is, is very present at every hour. <laughs> So probably I, I was a bit surprised, but this should be SDG 17, huh? SDG 17, not SDG 14. And SDG 17 is about how to achieve 
the other SDGs, uh, the substantive SDGs, SDG 1 to 16. And when you read the targets of SDG 17, you will have a number of targets that are specifically looking at trade. And if you read those, those, uh, uh, those targets, what pops up is the ambiguity as to whether trade is an end in itself, is a goal in itself. So free trade is good, whatever it does to the environment, or whether free trade is good only if it helps the environment, or if it helps sustainable development. Now that ambiguity has not been solved. And it's a major issue. Uh, it's a major issue because uh, we do know, we do know empirically that free trade sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. Uh, sometimes free trade is actually massively degrading the environment because part of environmental degradation is driven by imports from abroad. So there is a big debate, of course, but I spent three years uh, doing research in Brazil with a number of colleagues uh, uh, years ago on the, the concept of indirect land use change. You may have heard the concept of ILUC, indirect land use change. And essentially the, uh, the concept of indirect land use change uh, a change was 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 looking at the following issue. Uh, the fact that uh, that China need soy and that its main soy exports came from the United States and that those flows were interrupted during the Trump administration. So Brazil, which was the second, uh, main exporter or, or one of the top main exporters started to export more to China and needed to produce more. And in order to produce more, it needed to push cattle, uh, cattle to uh, different lands. And cattle, in order to move to different lands, uh, started to put a lot of pressure on deforestation of the Amazon and the Cerrado well, that form of deforestation and other forms of biodiversity degradation were in many, many ways driven by imports from China. So there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the nexus, the trade, the, the food, energy, water nexus, you know, combined integrated mechanisms. But the way to address that was to sort of cushion in some way the level of exports. Because if there are many exports suddenly, you know, you, you just change, that has an impact on the exporting country. Uh, so sometimes there is really environmental degradation that is driven by uh, trade. Many other times, uh, trade is actually fostering uh, uh, sustainability. For example, when you see trade in renewable energy equipment. And soon, I mean, not yet just now, but soon there will be more and more trade of electricity. There is already a lot of trade in electricity in highly integrated areas, such as the European Union. Uh, but uh, more trade in electricity will, will take place. Uh, and that may be, uh, if the electricity is being produced from renewable energy, that may be uh, you know, very desirable from the, an environmental perspective. But you see that there is this ambiguity that is never fully resolved, not even in the sustainable development goals. So this is this should actually try to take a stance, and it's not doing it. If you read this, you just have the impression that you no, know, we want trade, and that's it. And so it's it's a it's a major issue that uh, that of course cannot be solved once and for all, but requires a lot of consideration. Second major issue: environmental differentiation. How do you differentiate? Uh, between products that have, you know, are that contribute to environmental sustainability and products that do not, and that you know th there is a uh, a long-standing debate at the level of the WTO on on this because 
if you open too much the room for differentiation, then you may be killing the entire disciplines of the WTO. You, you, may, you may essentially reduce to, 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 to ashes uh, uh, MFN and national treatment. Uh, so the key thing is how you do it, huh? how you do it. And the way in which it has been done so far is at the level of what you would call secondary rules, not primary rules. And in, in, in international law, primary rules are the rules of conduct. And secondary rules are the rules that define the consequences of violating a rule of conduct. And, and in the GATT, for example, in the GATT, uh, there is this, this very important provision called Article 20, the General Exceptions Clause. And uh, the General Exceptions Clause is say, well, you may breach the trade disciplines of the GATT, but that breach, that violation may be excused under very you know, stringently defined circumstances. And they are defined in Article 20. Now, if you're addressing environmental differentiation through Article 20, that means that means that differentiating one good, treating one good differently than the other, because it has a different environmental footprint is in principle unlawful, but can be excused. That's the way in which it has been pitched so far. Another way to do it would be to say, well, treating differently a good that has a lower environmental footprint, differently from a good that has a higher environmental footprint, well, that's not unlawful because these goods are different, even if they are not different physically. But the electricity may be the same, but electricity generated through renewables is different from electricity generated from coal, by burning coal. If you can treat those two differently, and that different treatment is not a violation of, say, the most favored nation clause or national treatment Depending on how your, you know, how your policy is, is 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 drafted, well, then you would have a very different approach. It would not be that treating them differently is in principle unlawful, but can be excused. It would be that treating them differently is not unlawful from the start because they are different. That is not being accepted yet. So we're, we're not yet there. Huh? Again, we can discuss that a, a bit more. I mean, whether that may be possible under the TBT agreement, the technical barriers to trade. Uh, we, can, we can enter into some form of subtleties or whether we can find some halfway between the two. Uh, but it's, uh, we're not yet there. And of course, the issue of state differentiation and there is a big debate about the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And depending on whether you add, add respected capabilities or not, you will be already taking sides. As you know, the Climate Change Convention speaks about common but differentiated responsibilities and respected capabilities. The problem of referring to the full, the full principle, if you use CBDRRC, Without knowing, you're already taking a position in the debate. What is that debate? Well, it's a debate that whether common but differentiated responsibilities only operates in the climate change treaties or whether it operates more broadly. If you refer to the principle as CBDR RC, you're implying that it only operates in the climate change context. Because only in the climate change context, the words RC are being added and respected capabilities. Outside of the climate change concept, context, you don't have RC. So if you read principle seven of the Rio Declaration, which introduced the principle for the first time, it doesn't use respected capabilities. So you see that, and it's of wider application. See, so a big debate as well. And then finally, and where I, I was hoping that you would uh, keep some uh, attention. So let's go slowly, slowly, slowly here. I just have a couple of slides, so don't worry too much. 
So the question here is, how do you achieve change? How do you, how do you achieve the transition to sustainability? How do you drive the transition to sustainability? And here, of course, I'm focusing just on climate change, but it, the same principle applies to every area of uh, environmental protection. And the key question and the key debate is whether as in standard neoclassical economics and the, and the conventional wisdom of standard neoclassical economics, uh, everything has to be market driven. You're correcting an externality and everything has to be market driven or whether as the most recent thinking in complexity economics advocates and actually most of the, the latest policies uh, particularly in the area of climate change, including in the United States, including in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a climate change act in many ways. So whether it has to be industrial policy. <laughs> now industrial policy in, 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 in people that were trained in economics, I was trained in economics in, in the, the late 1990s and early 2000s as well. I mean, I'm a lawyer, but I, I did the studies of economics as well. Um, industrial policy was a bad word, huh? was something for developing countries. I mean, the neoclassical economy would say, you know, look, you try to pick the winners and you always get it wrong. Huh? Look, look at what this, you know, this, these people tried to do, import substitution industrialization in the 1960s. Look, it didn't work, blah, 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 blah. Yet, this is what everyone is doing today uh, for the transition to sustainability. They are conducting industrial policy, green industrial policy. And why is that? Well, because carbon pricing, carbon pricing in its two flavors, I mean, correcting the externality, the negative externality uh, through increasing the carbon price, through the corrective instruments, a tax or a trading scheme is simply not working. And why is it not working? Well, here you have the latest state and trends of carbon pricing from the World Bank, 2022. Every year, the World Bank will publish the state of carbon trading. It will inventorize, it will just look at all the world and tell you how many carbon pricing mechanisms are there. Right now, we have something like 68 carbon pricing mechanisms around the world, counting taxes and cap and trade systems or, or trading schemes. And what you see here is that most of them, including the most important ones, I mean, China, and, and you know you have a little bit of the United States here. The United States has no glo no national carbon carbon price uh, or or cap and trade system, but it has regional ones. The, this is one of them, and then California should be somewhere. Uh, but what you see in this picture is that essentially the carbon price is too low. It's too low. It's below forty dollars per ton of carbon. Only in a very few very few places. I mean, and the main place is the European Union because all the others, they have a very, very small emissions. And Switzerland, Sweden, Liechtenstein, Norway, Finland, well, the UK has emissions, Uruguay, and the emissions are very small. And they have high prices typically through taxes. But when you really look at the carbon price in main emitters, the European Union is between the third and the fourth main global emitter of, 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 of greenhouse gases. Well, the only one that has a, a reasonably high carbon price is a European Union. And still, this carbon price is far from any fair uh, reconstruction of what is called the social cost of carbon. That is much higher than just 100 or, or 80 US dollars. Huh? But most of them, they have very, very small carbon prices. So in essence, the industries that are causing climate change, they are not transforming themselves. They just buy allowances to emit because it's cheaper. But that's not the way to actually transform the economy. So if you try to make it market driven, it's not working. How can you do it otherwise? Well, you can do it with industrial policy. The good old industrial policy that everyone thought would be anathema and bad. And what you see here is what, what is called in, in, the, uh, 
in complexity economics and, and, and the people that are doing this type of work, um, experience curves, experience curves. So what you see here are experience curves for a number of technologies, uh, concentrating solar power, offshore wind, onshore wind and solar PV. Don't worry too much about concentrating solar power when you know we're shooting a bit in the dark or there is no major dominant technology. But let's look at offshore wind, onshore wind and solar PV. I mean, for Brazil, you know that onshore wind has worked a lot. Brazil has, has seen through industrial policy, a boom on onshore wind. That has been driven through a range of considerations, but a key factor has been the fact that the Brazilian National Development Bank has been behind it. So it's, it's a pure, sort of a very classic industrial policy that has actually worked. Uh, here is a global uh, picture in a report from a research project that I was mentioning earlier, uh, it was called EAST. And what you see here is that uh, onshore wind, uh, which is uh, the little uh, 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 line that you see here, is more competitive than fossil, fossil fuel in terms of you know, US dollars per kilowatt hour of electricity. So it's much more competitive. I mean, it's, it's really on the lower side or even right now it's cheaper. Solar PV, solar photovoltaic, well, the same story in just, in this story, you don't have the years here, but this story is a story of the last 10 years. It's between 2010 and 2023. So in 10 years, through massive subsidies, industrial policy into onshore wind, offshore wind, and solar PV, we have managed to reduce the price of electricity from these technologies far more than anyone could have predicted. Huh? Far more than anyone could have predicted. Solar PV uh, produce electricity is the cheapest electricity in history, as it has been said by the International Energy Agency, which was actually created to deal with oil. So this is industrial policy. So we really need to rethink the economic frames of mind that we have been using uh, to deal with the transition. And this is the last picture that I want to share with you. This is a paper that we, we published with, uh, with some colleagues and it's, it's in the report as well. It's a, it's a very complicated picture, but let's go slowly in discussing them. It's the last, uh, the last uh, uh, slide I have. What you see here are, you know, essentially China, India, and Brazil. And what you see here is how could you increase the number of electric vehicles through policy in these three countries, okay? in China, India, and Brazil. Well, the, so what we want to increase mainly is the green, the green surface, electric vehicles. Huh? And what we're seeing here is that the best way to do it, the best way to do it is not the same whether you're in China or whether you're in India or whether you're in Brazil. So one size does not fit all. But what we do know is that a single bullet, such as carbon pricing, will result in far less than many bullets at the same time, a policy mix. And that policy mix has to include much more than carbon pricing. Here you have, you know, subsidies could be a form of carbon pricing. It has to include carbon pricing, regulations, and mandates. And when you include all those policies together, the effects of all those policies together, modeled in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, integrated assessment model, is much more than the sum of its parts. So you need policy intervention, not just the market driving it. You need policy intervention and policies that are a mix, a mix of policies 
that have to fit the circumstances of China, of India, and Brazil. But those policy mixes have to include not just carbon pricing, but also good old regulation and EV mandates. And when you do, when you put all that together, in all three countries, the green surface expands massively. Huh? Expands massively in time, huh? in time, 2050. Huh? So you see it's a, it's a, it's a, so the, the, the period is always 2020, 2050. 2020 to 2050, without taxes and regulations and EV mandates all combined, yield this technology. This tech, then if you combine, if you add taxes and subsidies, that yields this distribution. If you combine these policies with regulations, then you have uh, another distribution of technologies. And the big jump where EVs actually gain a lot of the, uh, you know, a, a big share is when you have uh, EV mandate. So uh, these are just, you know, these are just the, uh, the uh, <laughs> when you introduce a number of these policies, well, the problem that you have is that you, you may get sued in the WTO. <laughs> and these are the two famous cases of uh, subsidies to renewable energies, Canada and India. Uh, when you introduce these, these type of subsidies, you may get sued. So you see that the main problem uh, is that green industrial policy uh, may get into trouble in WTO in the way it is uh, interpreted right now. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, we move next, I think, to uh, to, to the next uh, 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 lecture and then uh, to question. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Profesor Viñuales, for su Thank you very much, Mr. Vignuales, for the presentation. I see the chat is very active, full of questions for you, and that we will have an opportunity to pose in the debate, in the Q&A session. And now we would like to ask the commentator to take to the floor, Professor Mauricio Mequita Moreira. I'm going to introduce him briefly. Mauricio is the principal economic advisor of the integration and trade sector of the Inter-American Development Bank. He has a PhD from economics from the University College in London, worked at the research department of the Development Bank of Brazil and taught at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is the main author, among other papers, of uh, papers such as uh, far from exporting, internal costs of transport and disparities in regional imports between Latin America and the Caribbean by the IDB, shaping the future of the relationships between Asia and Latin America, India, challenges for Latin America, and unblocking arteries, a uh, report on the impact of costs in Latin American trade. If you're interested, we would be happy to uh, let, you, let you have the publications. Go ahead, Mauricio, please. Well, gracias, Veronica. Let me Thank you, Veronica. In, let me speak in English uh, to you know, follow up with uh, Professor Vinales. Uh, so I'm not a, you know, a, a presenter here. I'm supposed to be a discussant. So let me just try to, to comment uh, uh, on what Professor Vignal has just presented. And just say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think, uh, you know, uh, his presentation was very informative, very elucidating. I, I not only enjoy it, but I, I learned a lot. I think it gives a very good overview of the issues involving trade and environment policy these days. Uh, 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 and uh, what, what I'm going to try to do is to present a few reactions, concerns. Uh, I agree with most of the things he presented, but not all of the, of the arguments he presented. But, uh, you know, I'm trying, just going to try to be brief uh, in order, uh, you know, uh, to stimulate the discussion. And, and of course, take advantage of Professor Vignali's uh, presence here and try to, to, pre, 
uh, to pick uh, his brain. So uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a trade economist, I'm not an environmentalist. So I, I tend to see those issues uh, of trade and environment through this uh, you know, so-called tinted trade lenses, uh, just to you know, warn you about that. But usually when I, when I think about those about these issues, you know, trade environment issues, usually a couple of, you know, the first questions that comes uh, to my mind are, uh, are those. I mean, the first one is, is really wise to link trade to environmental policies, uh, particularly, you know, given the substantial risks of capture by specific interests, you know, protectionist interests, and particularly in a moment where the, you know, the, the rules-based international uh, multilateral system, uh, uh, it's severely, severely weakened by populist governments. I mean, it's, there's always been a risk of capture, but this is particularly, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable given the you know the, the state that the WTO is in and Professor Vinales talked about. The second question is even if we set this uh, you know risk of capture aside and let, let's assume there's no risk, can this linkage really be effective to address things like climate change or other environmental uh, outcomes? But let's focus on, on climate change. Can this really be effective? What the data says about that? And finally, you know, is there a way of, you know, try to minimize, minimize uh, trade's environmental footprint while at the same time preserving the gains of trade? I mean, uh, I, 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 Professor Vinales mentioned this at the end of his presentation, this uh, thing between, you know, market and policy, what is the purpose of, of trade liberalization? I think nobody thinks that, you know, trade liberalization or trade in itself, it's, it's an end in itself. It's always been thought of as a, as a tool, uh, you know, to, to, to promote growth, to, to increase welfare. So it's important to think that, you know, can we find ways of preserving a source of gold that has been particularly important for Latin America, for Brazil, uh, I know, and from, from Asia, no, I mean, if you are all poor, I mean, there's no way we can do environmental policy. So it, it's important to preserve trade for those particular reasons. Yet at the same time, we need to, to save the planet. So is there a way of trying to reconcile those two objectives? I think this is something that, you know, uh, really uh, we should be thinking about. So when I think about those answers, uh, the, the answers to those questions, my, my reasoning really goes like, well, you know, climate change and other environmental issues are, are classical uh, uh, externalities. Professor Vinales mentioned that. They are market failures. I think, uh, the, I think the trade off is not between market and policy. I mean, if you uh, need to address externalities, you need policy. The problem is what policy you're going to use. I mean, you can use pricing, taxes, you can use regulation, but we are talking about policy. I mean, the market has failed. I mean, traditionally fails when there are externalities. So, uh, you know, let's look at the, the, the best policy to address this, uh, this market failure, this externalities. So when I think about the, this, is, the, this externalities, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I tend to think that the best way to deal with that, and there's a you know, huge literature, empirical and theoretical about that, is to deal then at their source. So say a, a big enough tax on, on, fox fee, on, on, on fossil fuels, uh, uh, or, or, or regulations, uh, you know, directly, exactly a distraction of this kind of fields. Yeah, but then, you know, you, you realize that, you know, you can deal that domestically because these are global externalities, you know? So it will be just domestic, it will be much easier to deal with. So to avoid free riding, uh, we, we need a multilateral agreement. But then, gee, you know, I mean, when you look at the political economy realities of a carbon tax, you know, uh, who wants to raise gas prices these days? I mean, which government is willing to do that? Uh, and, and this, on top of that, you have all those geopolitical rivalries, which makes things even worse. 
So that means in practice that the, the multilateral agreement solution, usually, you know, think about the Paris agreement, uh, don't have enough teeth to, to enforce uh, 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 solutions. Right? So uh, like, like, we, like it or not, we are, you know, in this second best world. So what happens in this second best world? I mean, governments concern about, you know, rightly concern about, you know, saving the planet. They are taking a, a range of unilateral mitigation measures. You know, Professor Vignales revealed, you know, a lot of them, combination of carbon pricing, regulations, uh, and so on and so forth which, you know, uh, because they are unilateral, they tend to generate the problems of free riding, carbon leakage, you know, the, the idea that, you know, farms uh, moving to countries where there's the, the carbon tax is lower, there's uh, less strict environmental regulations, you know, uh, because of this free riding, uh, this create competitive distortions. So countries, particularly on those energy intensive trade exposed industries, you think about steel, aluminum, uh, cement, and so on and so forth. So they, they, they worry about those distortions and they worry also, I, I, I would say less than, you know, about the, the, the competitive distortions, but they, all, they worry about the fact that, you know, those leakages uh, tend to reduce the effectiveness, the environmental effectiveness of those measures. I mean, if other countries are doing, I mean, what is the point we're doing? Overall, the, the planet doesn't gain much, uh, 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 you know, by ad adopting those measures. So in order to try to correct those uh, competitive distortions and, and try to increase the effectiveness of those unilateral measures, what governments are, are doing, particularly in the developed world, they are resorting to trade-related measures, uh, such as, you know, again, Professor uh, Vinales uh, covered them uh, quite extensively, you know, the carbon border taxes, subsidies to production and consumption, so let's call it environmental goods, whatever that means, climate clubs, uh, uh, you know, deforestation-free standards, you know, and a number of other measures. So. The, the problem is those measures, uh, you know, uh, and particularly depending on how they implemented, and you know, the devil usually is in the implementation. They tend to run against the, you know, the WO, WTO principle of non-discrimination. Uh, so, so they end up, you know, uh, creating new trade distortions, and they end up, you know, adding. Uh, other burdens to the to the world trade system, uh, which is, as I said before, is already you know very weakened. And to complicate things even further, you know, most estimates, empirical estimates, they are out there in the in the literature, suggest that this kind of unilateral measures uh, don't have you know they are not very effective in reducing emissions. I uh, mean, not alone the you know. The, the the competitive leakage, which usually tend to be relatively small, but you know if you look at the impact on emissions, they are not really uh, uh, you know they don't make a big impact. In part because of you know, the, the 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 country coverage is, is small, uh, because of the difficulties in implementation, they need to make, make a lot of concessions to make sure. No, they, they, they're not going to be disputed in the WTO. But above all, I mean, the bottom line is that trade emissions for most estimates are less than 30% of the world emissions. So even if you shut down trade, you know, assuming a crazy scenario like that, you're not probably solve the, you know, the, 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 the climate change uh, to pick one of, of the environmental uh, uh, outcomes. And, you know, to add insult to injury, some of those measures, which, you know, uh, Professor Vignales call it industrial policy, which I, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure you can call all of them like that, but, uh, you know, some of those measures such as, you know, and the, the US IRA is a typical example of that, include domestic content rules for, for environmental goods, 
So the, uh, some others include restrictions on exports of critical minerals, uh, or, or even you know it includes plain increase uh, uh, in tariffs of, of particularly uh, of, of environmental goods because countries want to have their own uh, battery factories, their own EV factories, and so on, so on. So what this means for the globe, you know, for the planet as a whole, is that you're increasing the cost of adaptation and mitigation. So having said that, so my, my fundamental, and I acknowledge a, a difficult question to Professor De Vinales is, is this linkage really worth it? I mean, do we really have to go there and, 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 and risk uh, damage even more, you know, the gains of trade, the world trade system, given that you know we're not gonna really get a big bang in terms of you know reducing emissions for one uh, the second question is can the wto really handle you know this avalanche of of trade uh, uh, related questions uh, uh, trade related measures uh, uh, in a time where the wto can barely enforce bread and butter, you know, trade issues. I mean, we know about the appellate body. I mean, that's the, the enforcement function of the WTO is, is virtually paralyzed. So if we include all those environmental issues in, in the WTO, things are going to get even more uh, uh, complicated. And, and, and uh, particularly if we go this uh, uh, industrial policy direction, uh, that includes all those you know, uh, measures that favor domestic production. This is, for me, it's, you know, it's the, it will be the nail in the coffin of any attempt to have a multilateral trade system. And finally, what developing countries such as Brazil, Argentina, other countries in, in you know, Uruguay, Paraguay, other Mercosur countries should do? Uh, I mean, uh, it's, if the, the WTO solution let's i mean we of course we have to keep supporting the wto and hoping that you know this its enforcement power are going to be restored at some point but uh, we have more urgent questions i mean what those countries should do at this point in time to address those issues of trade and environment particularly those issues which are you know uh, uh, goes against the, the discrimination principle Brazil cannot export minerals to the US or take advantage of the IRA uh, subsidies. Uh, so this is clearly a discrimination. So should Brazil or should Argentina you know, take these measures to the WTO? Well, probably nothing's gonna happen. So what are the alternative measures to do that? Uh, uh, and, and again, you know, uh, uh, when you think of uh, subsidies, it's not necessarily a synonym of, of industrial policies of picking winners of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, promoting uh, domestic champions. You can subsidize uh, sustainable energy. You can subsidize energy equipment without discriminating against uh, uh, foreign suppliers. I mean, the, the USRA could perfectly subsidize EVs, subsidize solar panels without imposing domestic contents. That's where I think it's, you know, uh, 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 the, the money is. I mean, you can do that. This will be compatible with keeping the trade going and, and with all the benefits would include environmental benefits and, and have a, a significant impact on, on the environment. And just to conclude, I mean, the, the, the most that I could think of in terms of what countries, you know, like those I mentioned could do, I mean, and the most I could think of is general principles. Huh? I mean, the first one is, you know, uh, is the target principle. I mean, uh, the, you have to address the externality at the source. I mean, there's no way around of, you know, uh, avoiding uh, higher fossil fuel price. You need to have a carbon tax. You need to have, uh, you know, a, a, a cap and trade. Whatever you choose, you need to increase the the, the price of fossil fuels. Uh, and, and of course, you need to address the first station. This is this is shouldn't be a trade issue. This is you know an environmental issue. 
and has to be addressed by policies. Uh, now there's a clear market failure. The second principle is the multilateral principle. You know, uh, of course, the global analysis, as I said, you need to you know think of addressing this multilaterally. If this channel it's not open, which is apparently is the case these days, now you need to think of regional solutions. This this will be the the you know the second best. Uh, solution to the problem because you avoid all those distortions that we are seeing going on when countries go unilaterally trying to address. So think about Mercosur having a common carbon pricing or Mercosur has a you know a, a common market of carbon offsets. This would avoid all those other measures to try to compensate for carbon leakage and it will definitely maximize you know the impact on environment and would avoid all those trade frictions that might come uh, 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 up of it. And finally, uh, there's this do no harm principle. No? I mean, uh, it, it, before considering any trade distortion measures, you know, particularly those you know, that are clearly uh, uh, protectionist, you, know, you should try to look at things that you know, uh, uh, could at the same time curb emissions and reduce the cost of mitigation adaptation and at the same time increase trade no so we've done, we've done some work at the bank and and, and for instance we, we we found out that uh, you know when you look at the, the structure of tariffs in the region Brazil is a, is a, is a clear case I mean as most of the you know of Mercosur countries because of the common external tariff what happens is that you know, uh, uh, those countries have lower tariffs for dirty goods because of tariff escalation. I mean, things like intermediate goods in general, no? I mean, uh, 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 steel, aluminum, uh, petrochemicals, petro petrochemicals, they have lower tariffs uh, than uh, other goods that are less uh, emission intensive. So just by eliminating those bias that in practice, they work as a subsidy to you know to trade in dirty goods you could have you know uh, uh, and if you combine that with trade liberalization you could have a, a meaningful impact in reducing the carbon footprint of trade and at the same time promoting more trade which would be good for growth and wealth i'll leave it there thank you very much Thank you, Mauricio, for your comments. We still have some minutes for a Q&A period. I'm going to ask some of the questions that the participants posted on the chat. I have many screens. A question for Professor Vinuales. I have several questions. One of them says Pedro Pontes, that was your student in Gini Graduate Institute, he says that Professor Esti advising the Secretary General of the uh, WTO, the CBAM measures are relevant to meet the Paris Agreement challenges in a conflict of legal uh, schemes. GATT should have a priority. And after that, Daniela Matos supplements these questions by asking if we, if you can speak about the compatibility with CIPAN with the Paris Agreement, would it be consistent with the common um, responsibility framework, but differentiated responsibility? There are two effective questions, good questions, re regarding the legal status of CBAM with the GATT. This is not measured against the Paris Agreement. I have tried to took, uh, talk judges into the Apple body into these issues. And the Secretariat, that is very active in drafting the decisions, I tried to explain why the environmental agreement performed this way. 
There was a period where we received a lot of questions when George Arisavios was in this body, but then the circle started to shut down. But currently, the fact that the measure is demanded by an environmental agreement is not enough. Even though it is mandatory by an environmental agreement, is not sufficient for it to be consistent with the GATT. The trade-related environmental measures. The Paris Agreement do not speak about these trends. These measures, a typical example, the endangered spe uh, species trade. We have restrictive measures that are specifics that are the core of the agreement. And there are members of many CI this CITES agreement, and also in the uh, GATT agreement, if a measure, I mean, the consistency has never been analyzed. The Doha round attempted to develop it. There have been proposals to build a conformity um, presumption when the measure was adopted under uh, the environmental agreement, but this has never been consolidated. So the legality of this measure needs to be assessed within the WTO and the dispute settlement body according to the GATT and other agreements. The Paris Agreement can be considered to interpret whether the measure can be excused or justifies under Article 20. It should probably be taken into account to analyze this Article 20. But this article assumes there's a breach. The European Commission before Dan said that, and this has been discussed over the last 15 years, the analysis of CBAM legality started when the idea of a CBAM was born at the beginning of President, former President Obama's administration. It was approached based on Article 20 with a minimum exception, and that is to qualify the CBAM as a tariff. There's a loophole, a legal loophole, under Article 2 of the GATT that could accommodate the CBAM depending on series of conditions, the nature of the measure, so on and so forth. All this debate, when you approach CBAM, as Mauricio was saying, uh, the devil hides in the details the structure of the measure. I know the specific structure of the CBAM because I worked on this topic, but there have been new regulations that I have not yet studied in detail, but the main question is that the CBAM is legally consistent with the GATT. It is measured based on the GATT. The Paris Agreement, and it requires the CBAM, and it does not require the CBAM. So what I mean is that the Paris Agreement does not demand compliance of CBAM or any other tool. They just want the states to communicate what they plan to do nationally and domestically, and they have to do that at least every five years. And each communication should be more ambitious than the one before. That is Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Paris Agreement. So there's not a mandatory nature at all that the states need to implement the CBAM. Neither the EU, uh, European Union or the states are obliged to adopt a CBAM. So it is possible to justify it. It would be possible. It's not clear with the a panel or other body would say that the um, EU is right, or if there's a challenge, the EU 
uh, assesses by justifying why the measure was drafted in a specific manner in order not to breach the GATT right. And a large part of it was the, to say that the measure would be consistent with the GATT under Article 20. So what Dan says is a potential good conclusion based on a good reason. Legally, at a policy level, the CBAM is good for the Paris Agreement. At a policy level, the Paris Agreement would be invoked in a case to interpret the GATT, but everything would be measured, uh, taking into account the GATT and Article 20. So in principle, the measure would be illegal or unlawful, but it could be justifiable or excused. The there are some things that make, uh, that create problems for the measure. And that was the second question. What is the problem, the most important a problem regarding the legality of CBAM, regarding the BAM, the GATT, is that exports and imposes a carbon price. It exports, so it sets a carbon price. The CBAM certificates, according to the CBAM, importers have to buy CBAM certificates, and these certificates should replicate the price of one ton of carbon hydrogen in an emissions trading scheme. So there's a link between these prices. This means that an importer trying to introduce Chinese or Turkish goods outside the European Union, unless there's a waiver or a derogation, they should pay the price of carbon applicable to the European Union. And this offshore export has been considered unlawful by the appellate body. So it's not that easy, you know? And despite everything, I think it can be justified. If you tell me to what extent do you think the CBAN can be justified or legally consistent with the GATT, I think 60% it's 60% likely that an appellate body or panel would say that it is actually consistent. But it's not that simple. And this leads us to Mauritius' initial point, is that GATT rules have been built to favor uh, commerce or trade. There's nothing more unlawful in foreign trade law than local content requirements. That is the representation of unlawfulness. I don't know if you want to me to delve into this topic or to take other questions. Can you please name the appellate body where they considered that this effect was uh, unlawful? There are many. These are classical uh, cases. The tuna dolphin case. There are three typical cases where these extraterritorial cases are dealt with. 91, 92, then there's a subsequent one, and then film turtle. This is analyzing one of the letters of Article 20. I can't send you that document. This has been widely proven. And I can also send you the document where we provided all the models. I can email that to you. There's a political, legal, and economic section in this document based on the first C-band version, considering different scenarios. 
This was done with the Sustainability Leadership Committee of uh, Cambridge University. So what we found in economic modeling is that CBAN globally reduces global emissions just a little bit, increases the emissions within the EU. So it's a subsidy to the metal industry or the heavy European industry. And the big difference in terms of environmental impact is how to use the income of selling CBAM certificates. How do you use those proceeds? I can show you many graphs that illustrate this. In all carbon pricing, mechanisms, you have proceeds. And how are they used? If you levy a tax or create a carbon tax, and then you use the proceeds for some other things, the effect, the effect is much lower than if you use those proceeds to other cases, for instance, for other types of subsidies. So this is a review of the first version of the CBAM. I don't say that it has changed so much, but that change was really significant because emissions in Europe are increasing. This is not evident. I mean, we can say that CBAM is consistent with the GATT. In my report, I said that it could, that CBAM might be consistent with GATT, but the main point is the fact that we export the carbon price to other markets. And another point is that CBAM is legally acceptable if they have a carbon equalization measure. It should equal the impact of that measure for the domestic producer and the foreign producer. If what you are doing is protectionism, if the CBAM makes the foreign producer to bear a higher burden than the domestic produ producer, that is discrimination. And this relates to Article 20. And in order to meet the article conditions, you have the extraterritorial issue at play. Any other questions? There's a question from Natalia Bertulio from Uruguay, the Ministry for Industry and Mining. She wants to know if you know which countries are under the impact of the WTO regarding circular economy. What kind of effect? What kind of impact? Natalia, do you want to raise your hand, open your mic, and go? into the question. Explain your question. There you go. Hi, thank you very much. The impact, no, 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 I didn't say impact. I say mapped, mapped, mapped. What countries were mapped by the uh, WTO? The Professor Vignuele said that there was a WTO mapping, and I wanted to know which other countries, lots of them, but they're, the, they're all WTO members, because the databases they use are two. One, they have the environmental database, <clears throat> which is specific, and the other is the trade base. So they take information, they retrieve information from those databases. But there's hundreds of measures, hundreds of them. I don't know whether Uruguay is part of it. Thank you. Miguel Xavier says he works at the Ministry for Aboriginal People, he teaches chemistry, and he says, I don't believe that the relationship of the WTO with green policies is vulnerable. 
It is an issue, as you said, but I was wondering how necessary is the relationship with the WTO with a change of mindset so that the industrial policy in countries such as Brazil may move towards unifying trade and the environment. Just to clarify, I don't want any misunderstanding. Trade, international trade, is necessary and important for sustainable transition. That is the bottom line. Protectionism is very bad. International trade is necessary. That's our starting point. Second, it is not me that says that industrial policy when it gets into trouble eventually. It's a case, it's a fact. I'm not arguing, I'm not saying this is my opinion. This is a fact. There are cases and cases and cases, and that's the tip of the iceberg. Because the big majority, even the Inflation Reduction Act of the US, that has just been supplemented with regulations some weeks ago, I think it was last week, it has a local content requirement. So there are ever so many national policies with local content requirement. And this doesn't mean, uh, I mean, of all the national policies with local re content requirement, if you compare national or domestic policies with local content requirement with so many claims filed at WTO, there's pretty, uh, not many, claims filed at WTO and some claims that were decided on, there's only two that are really important. You go domestically, there are other cases, but that doesn't have to be misunderstood. International trade is very important for the sustainable transition. Protectionism is far worse. So that's the first item. The second item is that green policies, green industrial policies are necessary not just they're not just important they're necessary and dispensable for the transition carbon pricing is not enough now green industrial policies are not necessarily unlawful as mauricio said it is not necessary for a green industrial policy to have local content requirement that will be low not necessarily but it is frequent, very frequent, because politically speaking, it is very important. Let me give you the example of India, which is a very emblematic example. India is the third worldwide emitter of the greenhouse gases. It might be the first because per capita emissions in India are very low, meaning that if the per capita emissions go up a little bit in India, very likely it would become the first worldwide uh, responsible for emissions. So that, so as to find a way to uh, enforce uh, consistently the Paris agreements. And I'm not saying 1.5, I'm saying limiting temperature to the global average sufficiently, or at least a bit, even though we go be beyond 1.5, it is indispensable for India to be transformed. It's not something useful, it's indispensable. And how do we manage this? How do we get India transformation in India to take place? In India, uh, charcoal, charcoal is coal, is, is consumed a lot for production. India and China represent the future of coal. They consume more coal, and if they keep on, the emissions will keep on increasing. If they start consuming less coal, the emissions will go down. So we need India to become a low carbon economy. If it becomes a low carbon economy, a green industrial policy might be subsidies to renewable energy. What subsidies? The typical subsidy. I'm the state. I enter into a contract with the renewable energy producers to obtain certain electricity at certain price for a certain amount of time. And this is it. How do I pay? Uh, what is the consideration? How do I go about paying the contract or how do I subsidize this with public money, public funds? taxpayer money. And as India doesn't have a local production 
or is trying to develop local production, but the local production is very not very competitive if you're looking at equipment for renewable energy and it has a generation industry that is growing, this would mean, politically speaking, there must be transfer of taxpayer money to FOIS. So that, those are the international rules because foreigners are more competitive. So those are the rules, and I consider it completely reasonable, but politically speaking, it's not that easy. And ooh, if India doesn't go for a transition, what do we do? In that case, there are different things that could be done. The first one, local content requirements, as we see in India, and if a claim is filed, as happened that the U.S. filed a claim against India, we need to adjust. In the meantime, we need to adjust, such as in the case of damages in international trades, don't go backward. Uh, the amount of years that the case takes and the subsequent years where the adjustment must come, there will be still subsidies trying to support the local industry, trying to find a way of not respecting the system. But you see the dilemma. The dilemma is that if the economy, if the economic structure is different, when there is more uniformity and more competitiveness in the framework of renewable energy, I think the local content requirements won't be won't be there so significant politically they're important but not economically speaking and not legally speaking legally speaking they're illegal they're unlawful and economically that would be uh, in, inefficient but we need india to transform and if we go and see danespi i remember that the country agreement demands getting to that temperature, the Paris Agreement is very weak. The Paris Agreement is legally weak. And even in the case of India's sole reserves in 2016, the India measure was tried to be accounted for by making reference to the Climate Convention and the Climate Convention rights. And that was analyzed by the appellate body, and the appellate body said So you see, this is the problem, this is the tension, and this is why, for me, the green industrial policy is a fact. I am not defending local content requirements, not at all. There are industrial policies that could be consistent with WTO policies. CBAN, for instance, might be one of those measures, might very well be one of those measures. Thank you very much, Professor. There are lots of questions, but we don't have that much time. So we would like to listen to Mauricio uh, regarding this debate before concluding. Thank you, Veronica. Just two comments, quick comments. The first one is the following. I, I don't like the idea of charges that carbon price does not work, but it does not work because prices are very low. If they are low, it's no surprise that they are not working. And why are they low? 
It's not just that they are low, but Latin America spends a percentage of their GDP in fossil fuel subsidies. On the one hand, taxes are low when they are there. There are four countries in the region with carbon taxes or some type of cap and trade. They are generally low, but on top of that, there are fossil fuel subsidies. And why? We have political economy, government restrictions. They are translating my mixture of Portuguese and Spanish. I agree that they do not work, but why? Because they are not used correctly. My other question is that why, the reason why I'm not so enthusiastic about all these green policies. I'm speaking in English. So, my lack of enthusiasm with green policies and transition policies or industrial policies or whatever is first, there was a high risk of phasing out the multilateral trade system, the decision measures of local content with mineral exports like Indonesia with lithium, etc. And the lack of capability to deal with this uh, system is the final uh, end. Then environmental effectiveness measures to reduce emissions. What we are doing is in massively increasing the adaptation and mitigation costs in the United States. You increase the cost of solar panels and electric vehicles, so transition is much longer than what it should be, giving the current urgency facing the climate crisis. And I'm concerned about, about the ability of countries, Mercosur countries, to participate in this game. There's tax restriction that is very big in, in our countries. You all, all of you know that there's no money for social programs or plans, or let alone implementing uh, a, a US-like program like uh, giving massive subsidies or local restrictions. There's no money. There's no, there are no funds, so there's the risk of not contributing to reducing emission, but also being outside this uh, process of reaching cleaner matrices. To we want to produce EVs and batteries, we don't do that for obvious reasons. The United States do that, not only because of environmental uh, topics, but also because they want to stay ahead of China. Thank you, Mauricio.